Welcome to worship in this season of Easter. This banner from the church, made in 1997 by Mary Smith and Jean Clipperton, is a visual reminder of the joy that is proclaimed at Easter, and over and over again after that, as a lifelong expression of hope for Christians everywhere. Our opening prayer today comes to us from the Corrymeela community in Northern Ireland. And even as we share these words, we also pray for the people of Northern Ireland, where unrest has been exploding into violence in recent days. Friends in Christ, let us pray. God of the story we need to tell, God of the story we need to hear, if we only hear from one side, we fail to hear the fullness of your voice, spoken through the lives of people we think we know, but to whom we have not listened. Give us courage to open our minds and hearts by opening our eyes and our ears to stories you are waiting to tell us, to stories that are already here. Amen. single candle provides a focal point for all. Candlelight shines in all directions. As we light the Christ candle, we give thanks for Christ who is present for all people. May his light of love and hope be our shared focal point. Amen. We acknowledge at this time the commitments that we have made as communities of faith in the Bow Valley. Our churches and our members are blessed to live in these beautiful lands that hold such sacred significance for their first human stewards. We are grateful to the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Chinnakee, and Bearspaw for our ongoing journey on this land, and we recommit ourselves to the terms of Treaty 7 and the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which bring us into relationship with many Indigenous peoples. Both Rundle and Ralph Connor are affirming ministries, and we recall these promises as well. We strive to live into our affirming statements and our plans to be open. We seek to express Christ's own welcome for all people, regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, 
or circumstance. These commitments we make open us to the beautiful diversity that God has created and is creating. Thanks be to God. Today's reading is John 20, verses 19 to 31, where Jesus appears to his disciples. And I am reading from the New International Version. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This reading is from Acts 4, verses 32 to 35 from the New International Version. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is just part of our sacred story. Each year on this first Sunday after Easter, the Apostle Thomas pushes me to examine his actions, and each year a different aspect of his story stands out. Some years I feel drawn to soften the Doubting Thomas moniker that has been attached to him, for he only asked for the same evidence that the rest of the disciples had received one week earlier. Some years I want to lift him up for his role as, in the words of Malcolm Geith, the courageous master of the awkward question. In recent years, the rise of alternative truth and the ignoring of actual evidence in forming one's worldview uh, raises an uncomfortable aspect of doubt as we hear Thomas's story and his demand for evidence that matches his particular needs. And some years Honestly, I need my faith, not my doubts, to be given greater permission and endorsement, and the challenge of Thomas is not all that welcome. Today, I'd like to invite Doubting Thomas and his role within the world of doubt 
to lead us into a cursory exploration of the world of belief and faith and doubt. First off, as a progressive liberal denomination within the United Church of Canada, I can confidently say that asking hard questions is a critical, crucial part of our belief. Rather than approaching the Bible as word for word dictated by God, we use the tools of historical critical scholarship and other scholarship to ask questions of the Bible such as, when was it written? By whom? For what audience? Did the author have a particular agenda in writing this? What were the political, social, cultural, and even literary realities uh, when this was written? Now, already I have crossed into territory that some branches of Christianity would call heresy or blasphemy by even raising these kinds of questions of scripture. But for me, the questions are asked not in a spirit of skepticism or to trip the Bible up, but rather as a tool to help me take scripture with the seriousness it deserves. Wondering, disagreeing, arguing, debating, even doubting, are part of what it means to be in relationship with our sacred text. To ask questions of scripture, or to ask questions of the church, is to remain engaged with something that matters enough to be taken seriously. Doubt often gets set in opposition to faith, as if the two were opposites. But here I hearken back to Paul Tillich, whose little masterpiece of a book entitled Dynamics of Faith was such an eye-opener for me when I encountered it some 40 years ago. Tillich argued that doubt was an intrinsic part of faith, for without an element of doubt, we would have certitude, not faith. Tillich wrote, If doubt appears, it should not be considered as the negation of faith, but as an element which was always and will always be present in the act of faith. Serious doubt is confirmation of faith. It indicates the seriousness of the concern and its unconditional character." End quote. Doubt, then, is one of the tools that helps us finite beings try to make sense of things that are infinite. I stand with Tillich in saying that if you have faith, you by definition also have doubt. But what if the doubts you carry are of a different nature? What if they're not just academic or intellectual, uh, making sense of the words. What about doubts that arise not from our thoughts, but from our experiences? In particular, heartbreaking experiences. In today's Gospel reading, for example, it's not suggested that Thomas and the other disciples have theoretical or theological differences they need to resolve on the topic of Jesus. Thomas is at as heartbroken at Jesus' death as the other disciples, but he just couldn't bring himself to believe in the risen Christ without hands-on proof. Some have suggested that the particular shape of Thomas's heartbreak is why he wasn't with the others when the risen Christ appeared one week earlier to the rest of them. Over my years of pastoral ministry, I have encountered scores of people who talked with me about the other kind of doubt, the kind that spurs question, the kind that uh, is questioning the veracity of certain parts of scripture. But I have also walked with a number of people 
whose faith was simply overwhelmed by the hard things in their lives. A betrayal, a loss of career or prestige, a difficult death, a community tragedy, or right now, a full year without physical contact with family. These types of experiences may well challenge not just how we get through our days, but the very way that we picture our relationship with God. Indeed, our understanding of whether there is a loving, caring God at all. Whether it gets labeled a crisis of faith, a loss of belief, or a deep-seated doubt. These kinds of experiences can cut us to the core, as they did the Apostle Thomas. While there are technical tools that can address that other kind of doubt, there are no easy answers to this type of doubt. But I will repeat something that I said on Easter Sunday. Even in our hardest, most sorrowful and disheartened times, Christ keeps showing up. Thomas was missing from the group the first week. The risen Christ came back one week later. Plan A for my life doesn't work out. God's loving care will help me find plan B if I'm open to that. Life events knock me down. Trusted friends bear the light of Christ by their loving presence. I hope it does not sound trite to say so, but my life experiences and many of yours have taught God's desire to stay in relationship because God's desire has reached out and stayed present when our thoughts and hopes and ability to even consider believing in God have been broken down by the difficulties of life. Faith and belief and doubt are at times things I figure out in my head, but they are also things that get impacted by my experiences of daily life and the life of the world. For faith and belief and doubt are not static. They are dynamic. Thank you, Paul Tillich, again for picking that word. Faith and belief and doubt have a dynamic, active, changeable relationship with one another. But the other thing that is important for us to look at as we examine what we do and do not believe at any given point in life is that accepting the name Christian involves much more than just an assent to believe some idea. Diana Butler Bass is among the authors who are seeing a shift in how young adults in particular attach themselves to a church. For generations, we assumed that joining a church began with training about belief and then becoming uh, accultured to the way that church folks in that congregation behave. And then, and only then, were you eligible to belong. But now, Diana proposes that the order has changed. It begins with that sense and feeling that you belong, that you have been welcomed into the group. Then you engage with the community in the kinds of behaviors that Jesus engaged in, like serving others and standing those with those who have been marginalized. And after participating in the community and feeling at home there, then belief emerges. What's key here is understanding how important it is in our walk of faith as individuals and as churches 
to never lose sight of those Christ-like behaviors. Like reaching out to those in need. Like standing with those who are trying to find their voice. And this leads us directly into our second reading from the book of Acts, which talked about the way that the earliest Christians shaped their lives together. In the early days of the church, people from a phenomenally wide socioeconomic range were drawn to the teachings and promises of Jesus. Women and men, uh, from household slaves to the economic elite, were drawn to the gospel of love. Some members of the early house churches would have been highly intellectual, others would never have been given the opportunity to learn how to read or write. Some would have grown up with the Hebrew scriptures, others would have been raised more with Greco-Roman mythologies. But what they had in common was a commitment to community, remembering Jesus and his commitment to the human needs of the poor and the relational needs of the excluded by making sure that everyone's needs were met. Those earliest Christian gatherings were committed to what we may well call in our day a guaranteed living income, which, by the way, is one of the national pushes of the United Church of Canada right now. The early church was committed to be a place where the resources of all were deployed to lift up the dignity of all. And, building on long-held traditions within religious communities, that commitment to make sure that everyone within the faith community had enough then also began to reach beyond the group to help anyone who was in deep need. So, whether you were one of the group of disciples gathered the first week Jesus appeared, who said, yes, I believe right away. Or if you were one of the doubters, folks like Thomas, coming later, who required additional evidence. Whether your belief was sort of academic, or if it had been forged by God's presence in your life experiences. No matter which of these categories you were in, there was a next step. And it was the same step for everyone. Whether you were quick or slow to come to faith, whether you had a towering faith or really substantial doubts, to be a Christian was to share your possessions and to hold the greater common good above your own. And yes, the greater common good is still more important than what we take to be our own personal privileges. To express a Christian identity, whether your faith was strong or shaky, fast or slow, was to take the next step to practice what you preach. Pete Rollins, a provocative theologian from Northern Ireland, writes this, Without equivocation or hesitation, I fully and completely admit that I deny the resurrection of Christ. I deny the resurrection of Christ every time I do not serve at the feet of the oppressed, each day that I turn my back on the poor. I deny the resurrection of Christ when I close my ears to the cries of the downtrodden and lend my support to an unjust and corrupt system. However, there are moments when I affirm that resurrection, few and far between as they are. I affirm it when I stand up for those who are forced to live on their knees, when I speak for those who have had their tongues torn out, when I cry for those who have no more tears left to shed." End quote. 
for the first disciples, resolving all the questions of belief versus unbelief, was something that could happen in the community after they had made the decision to share and serve, after they had witnessed to the resurrection of Christ in the ways that Pete Rollins describes. Right from the start, showing the love of Christ Jesus in tangible ways was the lead edge of Christianity, the surest statement of faith. It's not to say that the questions of belief were or are unimportant, but they must not impede loving action. Our questions of faith and doubt get worked out day by day with one another as we ask ourselves who Jesus would have us be in relation to the needs of our neighbors and the needs of the world. So within the life of our church, are doubts permitted? Of course they are. Is a vibrant faith permitted? Of course it is. Will the doubts that arise from tragedy be held gently by God and we hope and pray by God's people? My experiences say yes. And however we work all this out, as individuals and as the church, know this, that the world that Christ came to embrace and transform by the power of love awaits our actions. Amen. Vaughn Baylor gives us these words of offering invitation that are specific to this Sunday and connect us in our day with those earliest faith communities. Lavon writes, Among the first Christians there were no needy people because those who were rich brought their resources to be shared. They gave up their advantages so the needs of all could be met. Out of the rich legacy they have passed on to us, we bring our offerings in thanksgiving for all of God's gifts. With that in mind, I invite you to take a moment now to know that the gifts that you have offered do make a difference and are deeply appreciated by the church and by all whose lives are touched. Amen.
On this day, O oh God, when we contemplate the earliest disciples gathering in both fear and wonder at Christ's call to service, and the powers in their society directly opposed to that agenda of love, change, and inclusion, we bring to you in prayer those places in our time and place where knowing what to believe and how to act on it raise so many questions. We pray with thankfulness for the acceleration of the vaccination plan, and we pray for all public health officials desperately trying to keep things safe for all citizens. We remember in prayer the 2,000 Albertans who have died of COVID, and we reach out to all who grieve any death. On this day particularly, including the Queen and the Royal Family, as they mourn the death of Prince Philip. As we pray for those who govern, we also pray for those who defy health orders, regarding the pandemic as a hoax or an overreaction. We pray for the environment, our local lands, the wildlife we regard as neighbors, and the broader concerns of this planet and its sustainability. Even as we acknowledge and pray for those who question the science of climate change, or who minimize the needs of all non-human living beings to have environs that are not decimated by development. We pray for people of all nationalities, ethnicities, presentations, especially those who live in fear as old labels and prejudices reappear, old privileges reassert, old attitudes toward diversity find new voice. And we pray for those who feel entitled to make life difficult for others. We pray for a lively, dynamic, healthy faith that will be impacted by experience, that will shape and be shaped by the God-given gifts that shape our personalities, a faith that has doubt built in, a faith that issues in action. And we pray for those who believe very differently from us, and those who view any relationship with the divine as pure imaginative folly. ever-present God, who by the power of the Holy Spirit transforms us individually and as a church to be your dwelling place. Comfort us here in the midst of our doubts. Grant us your peace while we face our fears, and increase our trust that we may embrace life in all its fullness. We pray that you will place in us all that we need empowering us as followers of Jesus to be a unifying presence in our broken world. And in the name and spirit of that same Jesus, we gather now in the words of our family prayer. Our Mother and Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A reminder to the Ralph Connor congregation that there is a Zoom meeting at 11 a.m. today to consider the installation of solar panels on the south-facing roof of Gordon Hall. Zoom credentials were included in the Friday newsletter near the top of the newsletter right around the information about today's service. Friends in Christ, we close today's service with these words of blessing. May the grace of God deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit richer than our togetherness, guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows. Amen.